Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest series of talks. And this is going to be on small bowel tumors. And I just put this together to speak at the University of California San Diego meeting. That'll be in uh, late October 2018. So I'm not positive if this will be coming out before or after that meeting, but uh, it's the second best meeting. Our meeting is the number one, and that meeting is number two. So I'm giving them a plug. Okay, so this will be on small bowel tumors. And, of course, we always talk about protocols there are many different ways to look at the small bowel, and we've discussed this in the past, be it neoplastic or inflammatory disease. Water is a great contrast agent as long as you're giving IV. Some people like positive contrast, and if you're looking for fistulous tracts or communications, oral omnipake works well. And remember now there's a new product, oral omnipake, preset um, 500 ml uh, containers, which works very nicely. You can use volumen, which is a, uh, it's relatively expensive, but it's a way of distending the bowel. One of the things about water as a contrast agent, in non-obstructed bowel, water gets resorbed. Volumen has methylcellulose, and so it brings water into the bowel. In a sense, it kind of creates diarrhea, and with dilated bowel or fluid-filled bowel, you could pick up small tumors. That's the theory, and it works sometimes. The problem is patients often get diarrhea, and... Uh, uh, very impressive diarrhea, so it can be somewhat problematic. We always use IV contrast, and we're going to use uh, 5 cc's per second, 100 to 120 cc's of uh, Omnipake or Visipake. The uh, applications in terms of the protocols, if I'm giving water 1,000 cc's over about 20 to 30 minutes works well. And again, as I noted, the injection rates we like to use. In terms of how to scan the patients in terms of PrEP, um, I'm not really interested in having the patient's NPO. In fact, we want the patients hydrated, so we don't want NPO. But we prefer for about two to three hours not to eat any meals. There was a recent article talking about people fasting, and they were talking about some people fasting for 12 hours, and uh, you know the concern always was vomiting, and we had that concern too, but it's typically not a problem, and hydrating patients and not keeping them NPO gets rid of the risk of uh, contrast-induced nephropathy. This article by Paula made the point that um, this study revealed no clinically or statistically significant differences in the frequency of adverse reactions in outpatients with cancer undergoing contrast CT with or without preoperative fasting. Some people, in fact, made the point that fasting would give you more likely to have some sort of a problem but this was probably longer fasting, so we're not too worried about that, but we don't have the patients fast. Drink lots of fluids pre-study and post-study, but don't eat a meal for two to three hours. People ask the question, well, what if the patient ate a cheeseburger? Would you still do the study? The answer is yes. Now, in terms of detection, the reason we always give contrast whether it's neutral or positive, is we want to pick up lesions. Now, this was a patient who had abdominal pain, and this was read as negative. It's an outside scan. And you can see if I circle it, there's a mass involving the small bowel, which was a gist tumor. It's exophytic. And you could say, how could they miss it? But they obviously assumed it was unopacified bowel. Though truthfully, on the coronal, look how much more obvious it is. All the bowel around it is opacified, and there's the mass. So you can see very nicely that uh, you can make mistakes, but contrast, positive, can work very nicely for picking up small bowel masses. Here's the patient six months later when they came to us. And at first glance, you may not appreciate anything, but if you look very carefully, particularly at the MIP image, you see the mass, which actually is enhancing. You see the feeding vessels to the mass beautifully seen. And in coronal view, you see the mass as being exophytic to the small bowel, very nicely shown on these two images. And as you go from the coronals to the uh, volume rendering, you really do appreciate the lesion. And if you change the windowing a bit, look how bright that lesion is compared to adjacent bowel. So, you know, you can argue that with or without contrast, you should have uh, positive or neutral, you should have been able to see the tumor. But you can see on either of these studies, it could have been missed. The nice thing about the water only is the ability to... Um, look for areas of enhancement, and in this case, you would have recognized a tumor simply by the enhancement. I'll just comment on volumen. Typically, we'll use three bottles given over about a one-hour period. We'll then give water. Some people use, um, so you can see for us, it's 900 cc's of volumen and 450 of water.
Uh, there are a lot of different protocols. Here's one of the protocols by LC. And the CT enterography, as it's commonly referred to, works across a range of different things. And of course, one of them is indeed looking at small bowel tumors, and that's what we're going to focus on today. If I look for small bowel tumors, I'm always doing dual phase imaging. I'm always using thin section CT 0.75 by 0.5 because reconstructions and 3D imaging is critical. Some tumors show better arterial phase, some show better venous phase, but from a detection perspective, think about carcinoid as arterial and small bowel adenocea as venous, but a combination of arterial and venous allows me for optimal lesion detection, classification, and staging of patients' tumors. And then, of course, we look at things with multiplanar reconstruction as well as 3D imaging, and I'll show you why in a moment. If I look at this case, this was read as negative, and I'm asking you, do you see a duodenal mass? And the answer is maybe, maybe not. If you look really carefully at the second portion of the duodenum, you see as I have a line there, a couple centimeter, or just a little bit over 1 cm, enhancing lesion, which is actually in the wall of the small bowel, and in the wall of the duodenum, it's not in the pancreas. And I'll just adjust the windows a little bit, and there you see it very nicely. And instead of looking at the axial plane, which was indeed very subtle, you looked at the coronal plane, and you looked also at the coronal volume rendering, you see the lesions very nicely because the lesion was a very flat lesion and the coronal plane, you're looking right at the lesion, you're looking at the wall of the uh, patient's duodenum and you see the mass which measures just a little over a centimeter, but look how obvious it is on the reconstruction views. Here's some more volume rendered images. Again, a vascular lesion, very obvious, but so easy to miss on the axial because in this case with a flat lesion, the way the lesion was sitting, it was not optimal to look at the axial view. So that's why when we're looking for small bowel tumors, and when I pick up things that I think other people have missed, it's not so much looking at the axials better, but it's looking at the full volume of data. So you look at small bowel tumors, less than 5% of GI tract tumors, with a variable clinical presentation, which can be tricky, and the presentation is often difficult to diagnose, both clinically and radiologically. Uh, we talk about how the average time of diagnosis from presentation for small bowel tumors is often 6 to 18 months, and that gives you a good feel of the challenges that we have. In terms of uh, frequency, we know it's a rare cancer. Age 55 to 64, like a lot of tumors, increases with age. Survival rate is about 66%, which is pretty good compared to some tumors. Here's some of the SEER data. You can see it's the 23rd most common so, uh, tumor, 10,090 cases uh, last year, with deaths at about 1330. Uh, you can see in terms of the mapping, it's an older person, but not necessarily that old, okay? And when you think about small bowel cancer in general, we talk about four tumors, adenocarcinomas, carcinoids, lymphomas, and sarcomas. And the incidence of small bowel cancer has increased fourfold for carcinoid tumors with less dramatic uh, increases over the past decade. Now, one of the reasons why we pick up carcinoid tumors more frequently now, maybe it's they're more frequent as tumors, but I think it's more the fact that we scan quickly, fast acquisitions, fast injections, and we're able to pick up small tumors. And I think when you were scanning with slower scanners or you were... Uh, weren't injecting as quickly, be very easy to miss these lesions. They're often small, and if the patient wasn't holding their breath, it'd be almost impossible to pick up many of these lesions. Now, if you look at frequency of small bowel tumors, depending what article you read, it's either adenocarcinoma or carcinoids is the most common, trailed by lymphoma, and trailed by sarcomas. And you can see the magic numbers sitting here. When I talk about small bowel tumors, I also can think about things as primary versus metastatic, and we are beginning to see more metastatic tumors. We never have seen a lot of them in the past. So you think about adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, carcinoma, and just tumors as the big four for primary tumors and melanoma and renal cell as the uh, metastatic disease. When you talk about adenocarcinoma of the small bowel, we typically think about four presentations. And this would have been the same description probably I would have given you for small bowel series, right? Diffuse infiltration of a segment, polypoid mass, 
constricting lesion or large ulcerating lesion would have been all things we did consider. When you look at adenocarcinoma, it's more common in the proximal bowel, most common in duodenum. Again, that variable clinical presentation makes it very tricky. Patients can have weight loss, vague symptoms. It's often hard to tell what's going on. Uh, there is certain conditions that have a bit more frequency, sprue uh, and Crohn's disease and celiac disease of three of them that come to mind. When you look at small bowel cancers, there's been some work suggesting higher risk uh, with cured foods or smoked foods. But again, Crohn's, celiac disease, familiar polyposis, those patients all have a much higher risk than the general population. When you look at presentation, it can be asymptomatic occasionally, particularly with carcinoid or GIST, could be an incidental pickup, but more commonly pain, nausea and vomiting, weight loss, obstruction, perhaps GI bleeding. One of the causes when we look for small bowel bleeding or just GI bleeding in general would be an unknown GIST tumor. And of course, um, there's often a significant delay from presentation to uh, work up because often the patient's symptoms will resolve on their own. So it's somewhat challenging in these patients. And you could see, uh, as we look at some cases, some of the challenges. Now I mentioned before about the importance of looking at multiple planes. If you look at the axials here in this third portion of the duodenum, maybe you realize there's a bit more enhancement than usual or perhaps a duodenum is a little thicker, but it's not that much different than what you might say is maybe it's normal. And you look at another slide. Is there something in the third portion of duodenum? I don't know. But I tell you, when you look at the uh, patient's coronal view, it becomes very obvious. Look at that tumor going from the second to fourth portion of the duodenum. The point that things are often easier to see outside the axial plane is really nicely defined here and this was an adenocarcinoma. Or this case, abdominal pain and weight loss, you see the dilated duodenum and then you see the thickened fourth portion of the duodenum, which you can see very nicely here. And in fact, you can see it better in the 3D volume rendered views. You can see the narrowing of the lumen as it goes through the um, transverse duodenum, a fourth portion of duodenum. Unfortunately, when you look higher, you can also see multiple liver metastasis. So this patient, unfortunately, is too late to be a, uh, a get resection and be cured. This patient had presented nearly two years earlier, and this is probably a classic example of why late diagnosis really limits your management. And here's just another image in that same patient with the infiltrating tumor and the multiple liver metastasis. 3D imaging works very nicely here. Again, it's a good example of showing you how we can look at the patient's uh, obstruction, how we can look at transitions in bowel, how we look at the wall enhancement, how we look at changes in the caliber of the bowel. And again, very nicely shown in this example. Now, with duodenal cancer, the tumors may be relatively small and have nodes. Here is a patient with a two centimeter duodenal cancer. There are multiple small nodes in the aortic caval space, nicely seen. And again, the tumor is not that big, but the patient was having symptoms and it was a great diagnosis. And here it is again. You can see the enhancing lesion. You know, things you would think about, this lacoma bile duct lesion, ampullary lesion as possibilities. And you can see it very nicely. And the lesion has some enhancement, but it's not really anything that I would call hypervascular. Another example, you see the duodenum looks dilated and it's also stranding. Maybe there's duodenitis. But when you look, you see the common duct is cut off. You see the pancreatic duct maybe is cut off. You see this mass pushing on the duodenum. You recognize on the 3D imaging that you're dealing with more than simply a stricture or just a mild inflammation. You're dealing with a tumor. This was a duodenal adenocarcinoma, which involved vessels as well as involving bowel. Very impressive example. Or this case where you look at the duodenum third portion, you actually see something subtly enhancing within the duodenum prom proximally. That's the mass. So sometimes you can get um, lipomas, which this isn't obviously. You can get fibromas, which this isn't. There's a solid mass here. You look at it in the coronal view. Look how nicely you see it extending and obstructing at the level of the ampulla. Just a beautiful example. And here on the MIP of the full extent of the mass, the very abrupt drop dead cutoff. And then here, uh, this tumor by the ampulla. And then as we uh, 
look down, you can see very nicely the tumor sitting there. So again, being able to look very carefully at these images becomes very critical. Um, question, will Cinematic allow me to pick up that duodenal tumor better? Here it really stands out when I show it to you. The question is, I could have seen it on the coronals, the routine coronals, but will I do better if I use Cinematic? And I'm beginning to think the answer will be yes, because uh, it will be optimizing a way for lesions to be visualized. It may also prove to be one of the um, directions we all go in deep learning. So that will be very, very interesting. And here again, just very nicely, the duodenum and the different texture of the patient's tumor. Now, occasionally, duodenal adenocarcinomas can be large enough. They obstruct the duct. can look like an adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. Here is one. It's a large mass. It wasn't very tr tricky. I considered it just tumor. I considered pancreatic cancer, but I thought the appearance was more likely a primary tumor. But, you know, this was a duodenal cancer. The patient was sent in for duodenal cancer. But it really, when you look at all the images, there's a mass, and it's, the epicenter is duodenum, not pancreas. It involves the pancreas secondarily. It obstructs the patient's common duct. There's extensive ulceration in the tumor. So I think that's a very, very good look at the tumors. Now, if we say adenocarcinoma is the one we classically think about, the one probably that's increasing the most in frequency is going to be carcinoid tumors. And what I'll do is let me stop right there and give you a break, and let's pick up with carcinoid tumors in two minutes.